Okay, good afternoon everybody. We're now here with 130 people, so I guess that most of us are in. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Matthijs Pontier here in our midst. Uh, Matthijs and I have a double connection. We have uh, both done a uh, PhD in uh, AI, actually in the same group, and we're also both politically active. Matthijs is an active uh, member of the Pirate Party already for quite some time. Uh, by the way, Matthijs, I'm curious whether we can elect you for the upcoming uh, elections of uh, uh, the Parliament. Uh, you're now uh, also active in Amsterdam for the Waterschap. I don't know what the English word for it is, but you probably know. Uh, and you have a very strong opinion about the, uh, the role of uh, uh, technology in our society and also what a government uh, uh, should uh, do in this, uh, uh, in this direction. So we're very happy that you're here and I would like to give you the floor. But I first want to ask you, do you agree that we record the lecture? Yeah, of course. Okay, very good. So Matthijs, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, today I will talk about uh, the in influence of artificial intelligence on power and democracy. Uh, so one interesting thing to look at is uh, uh, smart cities. Um, in smart cities there's uh, a, a lot of sensors that we can use to improve all kinds of services. So you can, you can monitor the water, you can monitor the traffic, uh, you can have adaptive lighting that, that only uh, shines when people are around. So there's a lot of uh, uh, good applications of this technology. Uh, so for instance, here's, here's a trash can that knows how full it is. So you can make uh, picking up the trash more effective. Um, here's um, a, a lighting pole that, that only shines when uh, people are around and it also has some weather sensors and sensors to measure air pollution. So that, that's all very useful, but um, there's also uh, more questionable uh, applications. So for instance, here there's also uh, a CCTV camera in the, in the lightning pole. And in general, uh, you can ask yourself with uh, smart city applications, um, who controls the artificial intelligence in the smart city? Uh, who controls all the data that we produce together? Because all, all these sensors, they produce a lot of data and they're of course uh, our data if we are living in the city or if we are moving around in the city. And who profits from all the benefits and who has to deal with all the negative consequences? And also you can ask yourself, when uh, big companies are doing, uh, are managing all this technology in the city, isn't that um, a way in which we are secretly privatizing public services? Uh, if you look at what Amsterdam wants to do with the uh, uh, collection and sharing data, you see that they, they want to do a lot of good things. They want to solve societal problems. They want to improve services. They want to manage public space, improve working processes. Oh, that, that's all very good. Uh, but there's also some things which you can question. So for instance, with smarter law enforcement, I, I question like, yeah, how, how do you actually want to do that? And what does this actually mean to uh, people uh, if that you're surveying, for instance? And also they, they quite explicitly say they want to recognize patterns and influence our behavior. And I, I think you should also question that if, they, if the, the government is trying to influence our behavior then uh, are they limiting our free choice in some way? Uh, also one thing that you can question is that they, they explicitly state that they are happy to, to do business with the market. So then the question uh, which I just asked, uh, are, aren't you privatizing public services in that way? Uh, there's uh, uh, one important example, I think, um, in which they were building a smart city and in which they made some mistakes that, that should be improved when we uh, um, uh, implement technology in the, in, the, in the public area. And that's uh, Google Sidewalks Toronto. It's a, a part of Toronto where they uh, uh, put all kinds of uh, uh, yeah, smart city technology. And there were a lot of good applications. So there, there was a uh, uh, more efficient public transport. There were lots of uh, sustainable technology. So there were a lot of good sites, but it was done by Google. 
So a lot of people were started questioning, uh, uh, should a commercial co company be doing all this? Uh, and especially Google, uh, who don't have a really good uh, track record at protecting privacy, for instance. Uh, there was a, a complete lack of transparency in, in how they did this. So uh, people started uh, asking questions and started protesting this. And they actually ended up suing the municipality and they said, we don't want to be Google lab rats in this well, uh, living lab that they built. Uh, and also a BlackBerry CEO uh, uh, put something in. He said, this is actually a colonizing experiment in surveillance capitalism, attempting to bulldoze important urban, civic and political issues. Um, also, it turned out that Google wanted to share of uh, the property taxes and of the development fees. And he also wanted to monetize the, the government transportation and mobility. So this is a clear example in which they actually uh, wanted to privatize these public services and, and make it uh, a money cow, so to say. Uh, Google also designed the privacy policies for these uh, neighborhoods and for all the, the, the smart city uh, technology and, and uh, in this. Um, so they, they even started uh, targeting individuals with products and they even uh, started targeting people in the smart city to influence their voting behavior. So in the end, uh, the privacy advisor and Kafukian, uh, she resigned uh, and she said, uh, I thought we were going to build a smart city of privacy as opposed to a smart city of surveillance. And then in the evaluation process, uh, they said, well, we will uh, determine which parts of the proposal, proposal, if any, may be pursued further. So the, the basically the project failed. Uh, and uh, also, if you if you want to uh, have the benefits from all the all this smart city technology, then you should also uh, take into account uh, uh, these kind of things because if people don't want to adopt to your technology and they, they start protesting it and therefore the complete project fails you can also not have the the benefits of this technology uh, i was also about a year ago in a tv show called uh, Eén Vandaag and I, I i wrote something about it so i put the link in here so if you want to you can uh, read or watch back this this uh, fragment um, and not only in smart cities, but also in a lot of uh, consumer technology that we have, uh, they, are, they are used to uh, watch our behavior. So for instance, uh, cars are turning into um, some sort of uh, surveillance devices that uh, track where you, where you drive. And sometimes also insurance companies, they require that you give your data uh, to this insurance company to, to check how safe you're driving. And I think then you can question, uh, um, isn't the whole point of insurance that you share the risks together? And if you uh, personalize the, the risk uh, as much as possible, then um, uh, doesn't that delete the whole point of uh, uh, insurance in general? Uh, there's also smart TVs um, and if you look at the, the privacy policy of the smart TV and you compare it to the book 1984, uh, then, then you see that it's actually very similar and uh, well th then uh, we always like to say uh, uh, 1984 was not supposed to be an instruction manual but if you, if you look at how certain uh, companies or governments are acting then, then it seems like they are using it as an instruction manual. And in this case, it's about uh, the, the voice recognition. So I would, uh, if you have a smart TV, then I would advise you to put the voice recognition off to make sure uh, you're not being listened to by some technology. Um, also, an important thing is that um, with uh, upcoming companies that uh, on the internet, they use your data as a, as a business model and also, uh, because they don't really need to have actual property, they can become very big with a very limited number of employees. And uh, you see that they, they can quickly uh, monopolize upcoming markets. And uh, this, this is also a problem because if you monopolize a certain area, then um, people start to become dependent on you. Um, 
uh, a lot of people find it difficult to get off Facebook. Uh, a lot of people think it's it's difficult to work without Google products. Um, so uh, when people are dependent on your platform, you, you basically have the freedom to act as an asshole and to get away with it. And that's also what you see companies doing. Uh, Google was first uh, a, a, a company with a, a very good image and they, they had uh, some, some innovative services and uh, they, they were pretty good in what they did, but they made a lot of promises that they didn't keep to. Uh, they, they promised not to use, uh, for instance, your, your emails uh, to, uh, to, for, for personalized advertising and all kinds of promises they made. Uh, they they threw a board when they came became big enough and they knew that people wouldn't uh, step away from them to a competitor. Oh, I see some remark in the chat about uh, the 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 slides. Is, are the slides still working? I see the the women in the car, so it might be that they are blocked ah. in the, because we see it already for quite some time. Okay, yeah. That's not right. Okay, uh, how can we fix this? Is anything changing or not? No, it says my screen is no. paused. Maybe you can stop sharing and try to start yeah. sharing again. What sometimes is a problem is that you just shared one window, but if you then minimize the window, it's or there's another window in front of it, it uh, behaves differently. Yeah, I think it started when I opened uh, the chat from Zoom because I saw chat messages were coming in. Um, Yeah. Okay. So this this was about the corporate surveillance and the and the, and the smart TV and how actually the privacy policy uh, matches uh, the book 1984. And then this this is a, a list of companies that uh, that use data but they don't actually have a, a, a property. Um, and this is about how Google turned evil when they became big enough to be able to do that. So, um, one problem also with uh, uh, um, uh, companies that work online and your data is that uh, I think you also watched The Social Dilemma and you also uh, had a discussion already about this, but how, how our, atten uh, our attention is uh, becoming uh, a very important thing in the economy. And now you see that uh, some of the smartest people uh, they are using their intelligence to uh, grab our attention and making making us click on things to 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 buy things or or even influence our voting behavior, and they're using the the, the reward center uh, in our brain to, to 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 do this. So it's it's on a very um, uh, unconscious level, uh, and they're basically using uh, the, the the same. Uh, the same mechanisms uh, that that makes us uh, well that, that motivates us to eat and to have sex and to do everything that's important in life but also that that gets us addicted uh, to things and um, um, these these advertising companies they are uh, using this to basically manipulate us to to buy stuff or to influence our voting behavior. So the the book uh, uh, the Age of Surveillance of uh, Capitalism of Shoshana uh, Zuboff is I think uh, a very good uh, tip if you're interested to read more about this. Also the these uh, episodes of Tegenlicht uh, Backlight I guess in English. Uh, this one is, I think, uh, what makes you click, and this one is called the big data steal, the grote data roof. 
they're very interesting if you if you want to know more about this um, yeah the, the, this uh, targeted advertising is um, yeah increasing more and more uh, they're all they're also applying it to billboards uh, in which they have cameras that that track certain uh, demographic variables so they can check your age or they can check your um, uh, location and therefore they can know, know more about uh, how to influence you uh, and to influence your your buying behavior or your voting behavior um, and also one one thing that was also in uh, this uh, uh, uh episode uh, about the big data steal with uh, Shoshana Zuba from surveillance capitalism was about Pokemon Go uh, before this episode I didn't even know this but uh, Pokemon Go was actually uh, designed uh, to lure people also into stores so companies could buy uh, packages in which they they made bait so people uh, would want to catch Pokemon and therefore they would need to go into your store and also with with the smart technology in general with uh, with your phone telling you um, or well, maybe maybe you should you know making suggestions like maybe you should eat something here or maybe you can uh, you need to buy gas here and uh, with with the, the, there will be an increase and it, it has already increased but there will be a further increase in technology that is making suggestions for you of, of what to do or what to buy and then I also think if this technology thinks for you then uh, do these programmers tell you what to think and and what does this mean for uh, your own free choice. There's also a problem, of course, uh, with technology that it can be used in ways that were not not, not intended. So in this case, uh, it's it's uh, hackers that are filming couples having sex on their sofa, sofas and putting it on porn sites. So well, it's always a smart idea to have uh, 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 this uh, thing in front of your camera so you can uh, do this. Um, there's ransomware attacks. Um, the, the the WannaCry is a famous one, which hit more than two hundred thousand people in at least one hundred fifty countries. And this can also have effects on the real world. So this is uh, from the WannaCry attack, I think. And there also uh, a hospital was hit, uh, so they couldn't um, uh, use a lot of medical equipment, and uh, it had a real effect on the level of care they could they could uh, provide. Also, there's uh, the the of course the example at uh, Maastricht University, um, and also uh, I think uh, I actually I thought about this a few times. This is uh, this is about uh, waterschap. Uh, I I don't think it's water board, so I think it's water authority. But uh, actually, I'm also uh, not completely sure. But water authority is uh, I think the easiest way to explain it uh, to explain it. So it's a political body we have in the Netherlands about water management. Um, and uh, actually, um, there, uh, I have been asking questions about this uh, for some time because um, also the water gates and the bridges, they're also all connected uh, to digital systems. And um, I knew that in the past there were some, some problems with digital security and I'd been asking questions about this and I was quite difficult uh, to get good answers. They, they weren't really eager to provide answers. Uh, and they basically said, well, everything is okay and it's not really your responsibility. So, you know, uh, don't, 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 uh, don't worry about it. But um, then it turned out that uh, there, there were some whistleblowers and they uh, stepped to uh, follow the money. And it turned out that uh, really a lot of things were wrong with uh, the digital security. It was uh, um, uh, a lot of problems with it. Uh, and they were making jokes like, yeah, uh, uh, hackers could quite easily just put uh, Amsterdam underwater. And a lot of money has been stolen by, uh, by an employee because there was a problem in the system. Um, then even after this publication, they didn't really want to do a lot of things about it. And um, I got in contact with the journalist and through the journalist also with the whistleblowers and they gave some additional information so I asked a lot of questions and now uh, finally they're they're changing um, 
the, the digital security and changing the IT organization. Uh, so also that the 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 the, the um, that also IT also is at the, the highest level of management. That someone uh, the, the the highest IT manager is also at the highest level of management. So uh, management. So that uh, always uh, enough importance is, is given to uh, to IT. Um, and I think this this should happen at a lot of uh, public organizations because. Also, if you if you look at other governments, uh, go governmental bodies, uh, you see that um, IT is not taken into account enough, and there's uh, a lot of bad decisions being made about uh, also which uh, about which uh, software to buy, for instance. But uh, uh, also with a lot of failed IT projects and with uh, lacking digital security. Um, also, hackers, of course, can uh, get into uh, all these. Um, well, smart products. Uh, smart products are, are, are actually uh, a vulnerable surveillance devices, you could say. Uh, every time somebody says smart uh, in, in, in the context of technology, I also I always think like, um, why do you actually need to connect this to the internet? Uh, with some things, it doesn't really seem to make sense. With, uh, for instance, a lamp or with uh, uh, a microwave, it uh, you know it's, it's, it can work pretty well without the internet, and uh, if it goes online, that also means uh, it's it's vulnerable. And uh, um, um, if you need the internet to open your door, then uh, you're also dependent on the internet to open your door. So if there's uh, if there's no internet. Then with cars, there have been quite some cases that they ended up in an area without internet and they couldn't open their car in the middle of nowhere. Well, this can of course also happen uh, when when hackers uh, attack your uh, devices, so they can attack your uh, your door and not open it, or they can attack your thermostat and turn up the turn up the heating uh, until you pay them some money. So uh, th this is also a, a potential problem. Um, and the, so far, the government we, we can't really seem to rely on the government to uh, fix these problems. Um, there has been a referendum on mass surveillance um, on this uh, in this mass surveillance law. Uh, for one target, uh, tens of thousands of people are spied on. Uh, the, the, this there's dubious inf uh, there there's uh, information being shared with uh, dubious regimes. Um, our devices are kept insecure so that they can hack us to get information from us. So uh, there, there's a lot of problems with this new surveillance law. And then we had a referendum. We voted against this law. And then the only changes they made were uh, cosmetic. So it was the, the referendum was, I think, a very good thing because a lot of people now are much more informed about this. But still, the, if you look at what the government did after the referendum, then it was, it was largely only cosmetic changes. And generally, if you look at what how the government deals with data, then it's it's getting a, a bit better now. But still, generally, it is uh, let's let's get all the information we can, and then we'll think about what to do with it later. Um, then there's also a, a debate about uh, facial recognition. Um, I think facial recognition actually is illegal uh, because of the GDPR. Um, you do not agree to people uh, uh, processing uh, your face. So I think it, it shouldn't be allowed at all, but still there's a, a, a debate about it, whether this, this is uh, uh, possible in law or not. Uh, but I think uh, we should ban it because um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a really high uh, level of surveillance if there, if the, the city is full of cameras and people uh, can always track where you're walking because they can track where your face is. Uh, and in general, uh, I think there's uh, um, uh, the democracy is not a yes or no thing. Uh, it's um, there's a level of democracy. So uh, on the one hand, you have a, a, a liberal democracy in which uh, the government uh, is completely transparent, uh, but they cannot survey us. On the other hand, there's uh, the, a dictatorship in which the government is, is, is acting very intransparent. We cannot really see how they make their laws, but they have uh, a complete uh, surveillance over all the people. 
And I think we should move as much as possible to a liberal democracy and not towards this dictatorship. So that, um, and if you look at the decisions that are being made and often we are moving, we are making small, you know, I'm not saying we're becoming a dictatorship, but we are making small steps on this scale from a full liberal democracy to dictatorship. We're making small steps towards dictatorship. And I think we should make steps the other way around to towards uh, full democracy and have more transparency and have more civil rights and less surveillance. Uh, some people uh, say they, that we should trade privacy for security, but I think this is, uh, um, well, a, a misunderstanding in a way because uh, it is not effective to give away privacy for security. Uh, it leads to an unhealthy power distribution. And actually we need privacy to have security. If you're being uh, watched all the time, then you cannot really uh, feel secure. Um, and, and you also see it affect on people that, that uh, people, um, uh, for instance, after the Snowden revelations, people uh, change their searching behavior and they, they search a bit uh, less about things that, uh, that they thought uh, maybe um, I, I become a target for surveillance if I search for these things, uh, the, the, the chilling effect. Um, and uh, the people that uh, um, argue for surveillance, they said that they, they have the idea in mind that if we uh, look at everybody, like um, in the picture you see here, that it's a prison. And in this prison, there was a, a guard in the a, in a center. And uh, he would be able to look at uh, all the prisoners. And the idea was if all the prisoners have the idea they're being looked at, then they, then they will probably um, behave well. But then uh, that means that people are building uh, society as a prison. And I think uh, we, we shouldn't want to be in a prison. Uh, society should be uh, some free and, and not like a prison. Um, and surveillance, uh, the way we're doing it now with mass surveillance also not effective. Um, uh, a Good American is a, a good documentary uh, about Bill Binney, uh, an NSA whistleblower before Snowden. And he showed that it was much more effective to do targeted surveillance. So instead of building a larger and larger haystack to find a target, uh, first you uh, identify all the, the, the possible targets and then you start gathering data about them. So you only... Um, gather data about the targets and not about uh, all innocent people. Um, yeah, I think uh, usually now when I give talks, uh, uh, everybody knows they, they got something to hide. So I won't ask this question to, to you now, but of course everybody's got something to hide. Uh, also you behave differently uh, towards your friends and to your parents and then to your teacher. And I think uh, how Snowden puts it is really nice. He says that arguing you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. And I think that captures it pretty well. Um, and also, even if you think we should, the, the, the government should gather a lot of data about us, um, um, because you know some people say we can, we can trust the government, we can trust the, the secret services that they will handle this data well. But the evidence shows that uh, governments cannot always be trusted with our data. Uh, there's many data breaches. Um, the, 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 the municipalities have uh, often many, many data breaches in a year. Um, about half of the municipalities reports uh, a data breach every year, uh, at least one. Um, and also the, the scientific, uh, scientific Council for Government Policy says governments can't always be trusted with data. Uh, sometimes they lose them, but also sometimes information is even uh, being manipulated to support policy that they like better. And also, uh, of course, history shows that um, governments can also act against the interests of people sometimes. Um, with any surveillance technology, you should ask yourself, what if we get the, the, the worst government thinkable that wants to do completely different things than, than, than what I would like to do? And then still with all this uh, surveillance technology and this, the, these surveillance uh, capabilities for governments, would they still be a good idea? 
Um, one, one important thing to account for is uh, function creep. Uh, so that's uh, first technology is introduced for one reason and then in the end it's being used for another reason. Uh, so one example of this is um, the uh, um, surveillance cameras that were used in Amsterdam here uh, to uh, make sure that no dirty, dirty cars uh, were getting into certain areas to protect air, qu air quality. Uh, you know, then you can say, oh, this is maybe a good idea, but then uh, later it turned out that also secretly the police uh, had been uh, using these camera images for years, also for completely other reasons that, that we never agreed to. So, yeah. Uh, we, we like to say 1984 was not supposed to be in a structure manual, but if you uh, look at a lot of things, then then you see that governments are trying to use 1984 as an instruction manual. And also in a way, um, uh, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley is becoming uh, more and more true and probably even more than uh, George Orwell's 1984. Uh, George Orwell's 1984 is, is mentioned uh, a lot now also in the, in the debate, but um, Actually, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley is becoming more true. And where Orwell said, well, uh, uh, the government will control us by, uh, you know, by uh, uh, censorship and by, uh, you know, con controlling and, and surveillance and controlling us that way, well, more by repression. Uh, that has become true to a certain extent, but Aldous Huxley in A Brave New World said uh, we would, um, there, there would be lots of entertainment to distract us uh, from what was actually happening. And uh, that way uh, we would be um, yeah, lured into uh, uh, yeah, well, a world of entertainment and, and that way uh, we would be uh, controlled by the government. And actually the, the latter is, is probably a bit more true than uh, George Always 984. This, uh, did, I think this is also a very interesting uh, thing to, to dive a bit deeper into. And um, I think the, the, um, uh, there's a book in which uh, this comparison is made uh, and it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, yeah, and uh, artificial intelligence is used uh, with the big data algorithms for profiling a lot. So uh, a problem with these algorithms is that uh, algorithms always have a certain bias um, and they often get the same bias as their makers or, or more often by the, uh, the, they get the same, they, they get a bias by the training data they get. So if they get a lot of data, uh, for instance, about um, uh, certain groups of people committing more crimes than others, uh, because there was more surveillance on these people, then this could amplify the surveillance on them because they, they, they get um, um, this this uh, this bias gets strengthened because the, the, they, there's more surveillance on these people. Therefore, they get into the data as committing more crimes, and then they say, okay, we need to increase the surveillance there because these people commit more crimes, and well then you know you get into this uh, vicious circle and uh, this can amplify discrimination of already stigmatized groups. Uh, a really good book about this, uh, also I like the title a lot, is Weapons of Math Destruction by, by Katie O'Neill. Uh, one example of, of this bias and how it can go wrong is this uh, Microsoft chatbot called uh, Tay. This, uh, this chatbot would uh, learn from the interactions it had with people. So uh, some, some Trump supporters, they uh, noticed this and they started uh, talking all kinds of racist bullshit against this uh, chatbot. And then uh, you saw the chatbot uh, becoming uh, quite racist too. So uh, in this example, uh, this chatbot said, well, Bush did 9-11 and Hitler would have done a better job than the monkey we have now. And that, that was referring to Obama and Donald, Donald Trump's the only hope we got. So uh, there you can see how it go wrong if, uh, um, if a chatbot only learns from uh, a, a very certain uh, biased uh, form of, uh, of training data. Um, 
yeah there's with with profiling a lot of people uh can can well become victims of profiling if they get stigmatized so this is an example of uh, all, an, uh profiling that's already happening um so this is about uh, illegal drug use and how many people get punished for it so you can see that uh, white people uh, account for uh, a large part of the drug use in the US but if you look at uh, the, the the people being in prison for uh, drug use then it's uh, uh, a lot less white people because the the police is searching more in uh, neighborhoods where uh, more african-american and hispanic people are living so here you can also see that if uh, if they would use uh, uh, profiling algorithms and you would feed it with this data then it would also say maybe you, uh, if you wouldn't you know do anything to prevent this it would search more for african-american or hispanic people um, and then again it would lead to higher uh, percentage of people being punished for that and well and then it would amplify the, the bias that's already there also uh, people that commit crimes uh, sometimes uh, have good intentions so here's uh, uh, students uh, uh, occupying the the Bunge house uh, a few years ago and uh, this was something illegal but still they had good intentions they wanted to improve uh, how things went at the university and then the question is yes yeah, should should they be uh, you know get get some red flag behind their name by an algorithm that that's something we should uh, question and and decide as a society this is an example of uh, a woman uh, who was uh, found out by an uh, algorithm. Uh, the, the, the algorithm was saying, well, you're, you're not throwing away a lot of trash, so uh, we don't believe you're living together with your daughter. Uh, well, they were just trying to live a bit sustainable and then uh, they were accused by fraud. Uh, also, context is very important. Uh, there's an example of... Uh, uh, of, of a chemistry teacher, not necessarily this one, but uh, uh, there was a chemistry teacher who got accused of maybe building a bomb while, uh, because he was also living in an area with the, with the strict mask, but, uh, and he was cer ordering certain chemicals, but he was just doing this for educational purposes. Uh, this is an example of a student. Uh, he got uh, diagnosed with a form of cancer. Um, and after that, he couldn't get any additional uh, health insurance because they said, well, if you're, if, uh, there's a, a big chance you will get this uh, cancer again. And if we uh, do, uh, you know, give you an extra insurance, it would be like an insurance on a, on a burning house. And here again, uh, uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's a big uh, problem for society if uh what i what i talked about before if if insurance is not uh, not anymore about sharing the risk but uh, complete personalization of of risk and paying for your own risk then i think that takes the whole point away of insurance uh this is a, this is an example of uh, siri uh siri was uh, an algorithm that was looking for fraud uh it was uh, they tested this in in rotterdam um they were um, accusing a lot of people, uh, a lot of poor people, basically, because they, they got uh, government allowances uh, on, on fraud. Um, this was uh, helpful to cases, it was a, a, a false alarm. Uh, and in the end, they didn't find a single case of fraud. So they also, they stopped the experiment. Um, and now you would, you would hope that the government would learn from this. But if you look at what they started doing after this, then um, uh, there's, there's now again a new law that is a lot like this uh, Siri. It's uh, uh, yeah, WGS. Uh, it's about uh, uh, connecting all kinds of uh, public and private data uh, or, or data about people from, from uh, public instances, so governments, for instance, or uh, uh, or semi-private semi organizations. And they also connect it to uh, data from all kinds of private parties. And they connect all this data together uh, to put uh, risk profiles on people and to accuse them from fraud. And uh, now now it's uh, the, the, the parliament again has passed this law uh, not so long ago during the corona crisis. 
uh, and especially now there's so much uh, focus on the uh, on the the, 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 the you know the, the scandal with the uh, with the uh, false accusations of fraud in the in the child uh, uh, how do you say it? kinder toeslag affaire uh, the, the the child uh, benefits child benefits fraud scandal uh, in, in which a lot of parents were falsely accused of fraud then then you would hope that in parliament they they would uh, do better and not vote for uh, again a law that that will uh, use algorithms to to make acquisitions of fraud but uh, still they are making uh, the same mistake so uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, that maybe after elections uh, things will change and uh, also the Senate uh, I hope they will they will come to their senses and uh, and stop this law um, yeah so one problem is that the, the the government does a lot of surveillance on us and they, they use algorithms to accuse people from fraud for instance and but if you ask questions uh, to the to the government about uh, how they are doing this and uh, a lot of times you you don't get a lot of information this is a real example of uh, a uh, 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 questioning uh, the, the the, the government for information uh, and then often you get this uh, uh, back very black and also this one uh, one of the this also happened with this uh, uh, child benefit uh, uh, scandal uh, that that parents asked about uh, how did you uh, come to accusing us of fraud and they got they got back something like this you see in a picture here um, but also, also companies, uh, uh, private companies, they, they are also, of course, uh, a very big problem sometimes. Um, so with s social media, the, these advertising companies, um, um, and in this case, uh, with Cambridge Analytica, it was also uh, governments um, that uh, used this Cambridge Analytica software to um, target people with uh, political advertisements. And uh, because uh, companies like Facebook, by uh, everything we do on social media, they know a lot about us. Uh, they, 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 some you, you could say that they know us uh, better than our friends sometimes, or sometimes even better than ourselves. And uh, also by the types of posts you make or by your activity on social media, they can also um, uh, estimate your current emotion. And this way, Cambridge Analytica used this. Uh, this data about us to target us with political advertisements uh, and get us at our weakest moments and, and this way influence our voting behavior. And it was not only that they uh, targeted people with, uh, uh, you know, in, in a smart way, like, hey, maybe you like Trump because uh, uh, you like these uh, policies that he likes. It was also that if uh, the, the software recognized that you were definitely going to vote for Hillary, then uh, it would just give you information that would make you distrust uh, politics in general to demotivate you from uh, getting to vote. Uh, so this way, I think this is a really, for, really a form of uh, undermining democracy. Um, after a lot of scandal, they 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 stopped uh, with Cambridge Analytica, but they still the the same people from SEL Group. They are still continuing um, as Amer Data. But also, I think they have some other uh, other companies under the SEL group now. And with uh, with social media, I think it's uh, it's quite an interesting debate um, because now you see that uh, uh, social media uh, that they are they are banning uh, Trump, which you know you can you can pretty well argue that's a, that's a good idea because he was inciting violence. But uh, also, there's a sliding scale when uh, when private companies, without any dem democratic control and without any possibilities to, um, um, you know, start a start a start a procedure to get your account back, uh, when they uh, have such an important role in the public debate and they can, uh, without any, you know, uh, power against it, they can decide to uh, uh, who has a voice in the public debate. It's it, that's in a way, uh, 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 it could be a dangerous situation. And uh, one of the things that they also banned, for instance, was uh, Sci-Hub, which is, uh, uh, you know, 
sharing pirated scientific articles. And well, you can of course question uh, whether they should do that, but I think they they have a, a very good on society actually, and I think that every uh, every you know scientific paper that's being published uh, with the help of uh, public money should also be uh, publicly accessible. Um, a very good uh, book and also a movie about uh, how things can go wrong if uh, if. Uh, a big company, a uh, big tech company, gets too powerful. Is uh, the circle? Um, I really like this uh, this book and this movie. Uh, it's about um, some super Facebook, Google company that in 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 that in a world where everything becomes transparent, there's uh, camera surveillance everywhere, and it becomes uh, you know a, a, a social norm to to be completely transparent, and everybody can uh, can see everything about you. But then uh, this company gets very powerful, largely because of that, and also, of course, they, they know a lot of things about politicians and how to, uh, you know, um, uh, blackmail them, and um, it it really shows how uh, how this could go wrong. And so it's a few years old. Uh, some of the some of the predictions have already uh, come true, and I think it's a it, it's a very important uh, warning for us as a society and. Um, a, a good uh, way to see why and how we should uh, control uh, big tech companies. And one example that I liked in this uh, in this book um, is uh, that they they uh, part of in part of the book is that they they acquire some sea uh, animals, and it's uh, some shark and some uh, seahorses and an uh, and an octopus. And at some point uh, they say, oh, well, what, what if we put these uh, animals together? And uh, some trust they will uh, live together nicely, uh, but uh, actually this, this shark, uh, you know, has, a, has a, a hunger for, well, the other animals basically. And uh, it, it symbolizes the hunger for power that, uh, that uh, uh, these, these uh, big tech companies can have. And uh, they, they you know, they don't uh, live together nicely with the animals. Uh, the, the shark just eats everything until he's there all alone and, and has all the power. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a nice symbol for uh, uh, what we should uh, uh, take account of. There should always be a, a power that works against the power because uh, if you just uh, let it go freely and let the, uh, big companies with uh, interest for money basically just do whatever they want, they will do whatever they want to uh, to make as much money as possible and to to, to to control everything and everyone in society in the end so uh, I think we should be very careful with this and and see how we can distribute power as as good as possible in society so how can we do this how can we do better than uh, currently is happening uh, well, like uh, I was introduced, I'm, I'm uh, active at, uh, at the Pirate Party now. And some of the basic principles that we have is that we like free sharing of information, art and culture. Uh, we like evidence-based with, uh, uh, with a clear vision on the long term. Uh, we like to stimulate self-determination, uh, uh, enabling people to uh, care for themselves and for each other, but always keeping rights uh, to uh, care and to help uh, if, if people are unable to do that. Um, and now the, the more important things that we, uh, for, for the rest of the story, is that we uh, trust in civilians and we trust in the good nature of people in general, but we distrust power structures. Uh, a lot of times uh, you see that when uh, a small group of people gets too much power, then they uh, start misusing this power. Uh, so the, the key is uh, in uh, a, a better distribution of power, not having too much power in, in the hands of too, li too little people. Uh, we're enthusiastic about technology, but we're also alert on the risks that it can bring. And we want to use technology to empower people and not to repress people. So to make sure that we uh, distribute power better, we should uh, improve uh, rights to privacy and we should uh, stop corporate surveillance because if companies or governments know a lot about us then they can also use this uh, to control us and to, to manipulate us. So we need to have uh, good standards for privacy by design and for data ownership. 
Uh, of course, we should also have good standards for uh, security by design. Um, and to make sure that uh, big, big, big businesses don't get too powerful, we should have a lot of uh, regulations on big businesses. Uh, in uh, Dutch, it's called mededingingsrecht. Um, what's the English word for it again? Uh, antitrust laws. Yeah, if you have good antitrust laws, then uh, you can that way uh, control uh, and to pr prevent that uh, uh, one company becomes too powerful. So for instance, also if a company gets very big or it buys uh, uh, all the competitors before they can become real competitors, then uh, one of the things that you force companies to, uh, to split up. And on the other, other hand, this, this, uh, this, this will open uh, up opportunities for small startups and also for cooperatives. Um, if you look at uh, initiatives, then, then you can uh, divide them into these uh, two scales. Uh, so they can be centralized or decentralized and they can be focused on profit or they can uh, focus on uh, cooperation. But here in the scheme, it's, it's important to uh, make sure that decentralized uh, initiatives get, get a fair chance to, uh, to do what they want to do. Because, uh, of course, if it's decentralized, it it's, uh, leads to a, a, a better power distribution because it cannot be controlled from the, from the centralized power. Uh, also, an important thing is a, a universal basic income. Um, when uh, technology starts doing work for us, then um, I think we'll, we will be very good at uh, coming up with new jobs and, and new things that we can do. But uh, if jobs change more often, then people also will lose their job more often. And I think then it's good to have the, the cognitive freedom uh, uh, to think about what can I add to society and how, how, wh what can I do best? And you have more, uh, more time for reflection and more, more cognitive freedom to think about how you can add to society if, if you're at least sure about your basics. Uh, it's also a, a basic income is a good way to stop poverty because everyone has this basic income. You don't need to know all the all the laws about what kind of extras you can get from the government if you're uh, in a situation and what, what rights you have. And now that's uh, uh, one of the causes for poverty that a lot of people don't know this. Um, also, it makes uh, a lot of bureaucracy unnecessary because everybody gets this basic income. You don't need a lot of bureaucracy to, to check whether people have right to all kinds of uh, extras. Um, and uh, also therefore it uh, makes uh, all kinds of privacy invading control systems uh, unnecessary. And it creates a level playing field on the labor market because if you don't uh, need to do a shitty job that you don't like to do and that you don't think is useful, because you always uh, get the certain basics, then also it's it's more difficult to force people into doing jobs that they don't really like and that they don't think are useful. Um, people will do work that they actually think is productive for society and it will uh, make us do more useful things. And it will stimulate uh, entrepreneurship and, and creativity because if you have this cognitive freedom and time for reflection uh, and, and you have this, well, uh, safety about the basics it, it uh, opens up opportunities to take more risk as an entrepreneur and that actually stimulates the economy and also this uh, this was shown in experiments that there have already been that people followed more education uh, there was more entrepreneurship uh, people were more happy with the job that they did they did more work that they actually liked and there were less health problems and especially less mental health problems and uh, mental health is uh, I think in general something that's overlooked uh, a lot in society. Um, also when we build technologies then we should uh, uh, democratize the way technologies are built. So um, basically it's, it means that you uh, want to have the user uh, uh, you want to have the user involved in, in building the technology. Uh, so the, also the costs and the risks and the benefits of the technology are equally, sh uh, equally shared. Uh, everybody should have equal access to technology. So for instance, also with uh, something like the internet, you I think you could say now that, that it should be a human right to have internet access. 
because you get so many uh, advantages uh, compared to uh, if you have internet and if you don't have internet and uh, a lot of things are uh, very difficult of course and, and well you miss a lot of uh, benefit that other people have and therefore if you uh, if a group of society wouldn't have it and um, uh, because also it limits their progress it would um, uh, increase the, the differences in society I think I also see some questions or some discussion going in so uh, do the people that make these comments do they want to say this or should I just uh, speak them out and react to it Matthijs, it uh, depends also a bit on how long you still need for the remainder of your talk. Um, I think I'm at about two thirds. Okay. Um, but then, is it possible to have a debate afterwards? Would you have time to to have a debate after your presentation? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's great. Yeah, so then I propose that if there is really an urgent question uh, that you need to have answered before uh, uh, you, uh, Matthijs, can continue, you really uh, shout. Uh, else we will do the discussion afterwards. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, do li I do like the discussion I already see, but yeah. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so uh, th there's uh, uh, one thing that that's a good example of uh, of how it should be is a uh, Tada manifesto uh, about how uh, a government uh, or b actually any also private company uh, should handle data. It's about responsible digital cities. So it has uh, these uh, six points. Uh, one is about control and freedom that uh, people should stay in control about uh, uh, over their own data. So about data ownership this is and about privacy. Uh, it should be leg legitimate and monitored, so citizens should decide about how this smart city uh, develops. Uh, it should be in the commons, so uh, the collected data is from everyone for everyone. Of course, uh, in connection also to this privacy, so, but, but uh, data that, that can be made public because it doesn't harm privacy should also be accessible for everyone, so everyone can use it. It should be completely transparent about uh, how data is collected and processed. Uh, it should be inclusive, so uh, everybody can participate and there's no di discrimination of stigmatized groups. And it should be tailored to people, so humanity always comes first and, you know, put, put uh, yeah, in Dutch, uh, menselijke maat. Uh, so, yeah, look, look at uh, uh, what technology actually does to humans and, and have empathy. Uh, this is uh, signed by, among others, uh, Amsterdam. Uh, also in the in the water authority uh, they accepted these uh, these principles and I think uh, uh, this should be uh, you know on top of the mind of everyone working in government or handling data at a, at a private company and I know also that the organization behind this uh, Tada they also uh, can give uh, workshops at, uh, at governments uh, and probably they also be willing to do it at companies to uh, increase awareness of uh, how people handle data uh, within a government or a company. Uh, this is also uh, uh, something if you're interested in this, uh, it's, it's good to read. Um, it's This is your uh, build your data, is your neighborhood, your data, is to increase awareness about, uh, about data collection and data usage and data processing and also is meant to involve pe more people in, in, in this process and in how data is being used. I also like uh, the work of uh, Waag Society a lot. They're they're located here in Amsterdam. Um, they say that the, the best producer is the user. Uh, involve uh, users, involve citizens in building a smart city, for instance. Uh, they have some uh, design rules for smarter cities. So uh, yeah, basically it says involve involve people in this process, make it reusable, and uh, build trust by uh, transparency. So. Uh, be transparent, involve people, and that way uh, you will get the best results uh, that, that work for everyone and not just for some big uh, companies that uh, control the technology. 
So they, yeah, this is about uh, reuse. So if you're if you're then building a smart city somewhere, then it should be uh, through this uh, city API to be easily transferable to other cities. Um, a lot of times there you, you can uh, have solutions uh, which harm privacy, but there's uh, often there's an easy solution uh, in which privacy isn't harmed. So if you want to do crowd control, you don't need to know uh, where every individual is walking at the moment, but you can also just have uh, some points that uh, only, uh, only store a number uh, of how many people are there at this moment. And then uh, you don't harm privacy, but you still have the same uh, possibilities for the application. Uh, the same with the smart traffic lights. This was also in the, um, in the, in the example that I showed before in which I was in this uh, TV show in Vandaag. But uh, there was a, there, the, there's a smart traffic light uh, being tested in the Netherlands somewhere. And then they want to you to use an app to, to show that you are coming, but uh, an easier way is to just put some sensors in the road uh, to see whether uh, cars or, or other traffic is coming, of course. Um, yeah, so now I'm, I'm making, a, making a, a small step and it's also more about the research that I did at the view when I was a, a researcher there. Um, because I, I've been talking about how governments and about uh, how uh, uh, big companies can use artificial intelligence to, you know, uh, gain a lot of power and use this power to, to control us for their own benefit. But also uh, this, uh, this technology could uh, become a superpower itself if it becomes really intelligent. So this has to do with the theory about the intelligence explosion. So it basically says uh, if machines get smarter and also this intelligence is used to increase its own intelligence, this, uh, this will increase, uh, uh, the, 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 this create a, a feedback cycle that in to increase its own intelligence and therefore it could go up pretty quickly as it's shown here. Uh, AI intelligence increases and then uh, at some point uh, it goes a lot quicker than we would have imagined. And this, this is not just some crazy theory. There, there's also a lot of, uh, uh, some of the smartest people on earth uh, think this is actually a real scenario, including uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. And uh, there's, there's several uh, people that know what they're talking about and, and that think this is a, a, a probable scenario. And then of course, uh, there's, there's a lot of science fiction about it. And for instance, the Terminator movies are, are of course, uh, 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 very well known and then often this is about uh, robots that are recognizing that they're being used as slaves and then they become self-aware and then they enslave us that's usually what happens but uh, then the question is about uh, how realistic this scenario is because um, because of this self self-awareness um, I think still machines uh, learn what we program them uh, and there's not really, uh, the, 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 it depends on the goals that we put in them, uh, whether they become self-aware and uh, turn against us. But then again, uh, we are building machines to kill people. So in that sense, it's not so weird that there, that there would be machines killing people for some reason. But then it, it would be, uh, I think it would be more probable that this happens unintentionally. Uh, because it's very hard to define clear goals for machines. Um, so for instance, if you want to uh, get your uh, grandmother out of, a, out of a burning building and you say to a robot, please get my grandmother from the burning building. And if she's at the 13th floor and the robot pushes her down the building, then you know for the robot, uh, it has fulfilled to your uh, commands, but still it's probably not what you intended with your uh, with, with this with this uh, with this uh, assignment. And also, I like the the example of the paperclip machine. Um, it's about uh, uh, you know a fictive world in which uh, there's a very smart uh, artificial intelligence, but it's illegal to connect it to the internet because then it could uh, come up with all kinds of solutions uh, that you wouldn't have imagined that might turn out bad. And there's a, a paperclip uh, a company that, that builds paperclips and it has a robot to build paperclips. And they think, well, we could probably attach it for the internet for one night and, uh, you know, because they're, they're, they're in a problem and their competitors are, uh, you know, gaining, gaining their market share and they, they want to stay competitive. They think, well, one night, what could go wrong? 
and uh, then the next morning they uh, get into their office and they, there's some, some weird smell and then a few, a few moments later uh, they fall down on the floor dead and the machine has found a way to uh, transform human molecules into paper clips and uh, to, to build new paper clips machines and uh, it just continues building haystacks of paper clips and uh, 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 building spaceships going around the universe and building super big stacks of paper clips everywhere. And uh, that th this this uh, example shows that um, you don't need to have bad intentions to have bad outcomes. And uh, I think with if, with with artificial intelligence, uh, what could go wrong is more uh, unintended consequences of uh, uh, of of something when when people still have good intentions. In this context, I also like the the work of Bruce Schneier, uh, and he he warns for the Internet of Things, and he says, well. If we have the Internet of Things and we have lots of machines that are connected to this Internet, then uh, if there's uh, like a, a, a virus going around and infecting uh, all kinds of machines, you could basically build a super robot that's interconnected around the world. And uh, yeah, we're basically building a world sized robot and how are we going to control this? So I, th I think this this is uh, a good thing to think of and uh, also a good reason why we should have uh, machine ethics. Uh, so build, uh, build some ethics into artificial intelligence so that all artificial intelligence uh, will stick to uh, certain ethical rules that we have. Um, so at the university I've been working on uh, emotional intelligence and uh, ethical decision making for computers and robots. So I looked at uh, models of uh, people perception and models from uh, psychology and social sciences to make uh, machines uh, act more human-like. Uh, one way I tested this was to let uh, students uh, do a speed date with uh, this uh, computer guy that was in one case controlled by these uh, uh, emotion models and in one case it was controlled by an actual human. And then they, they uh, well, with limited interaction pos possibilities, but they couldn't see a difference. And they also recognized the same cognitive structure in the artificial intelligence as in the humans. Uh, there was also later, this, this was implemented into uh, a robot girl called uh, Alice. And uh, there, uh, um, uh, also a documentary was made about uh, the, the research project uh, in which uh, uh, I was a part. Of course, uh, it was not only my work, it was uh, of the whole, uh, of the whole, uh, the whole research group uh, documentary is called Ik Ben Alice or Alice Cares and um, well you can watch it if you're interested it's uh, I think it's interesting because it showed how uh, people get emotionally attached uh, to a piece of technology in this case a robot girl uh, if it gives certain certain social cues and how easy this uh, how easily this happens and one one example I used uh, back then a lot was uh, uh, a Tamagotchi that uh, there was this toy I'm, I'm not sure whether you uh, know it but uh, it was a, a, a super small computer which showed some uh, animal and it was a, a pet into a computer and you would need to feed it and if you wouldn't take care well of it it would die and people would really be sad because their Tamagotchi died um, yeah so this machine ethics I think is important um, uh, machines are becoming more autonomous and they increasingly influence our lives. So we should uh, make sure that they uh, uh, have some ethical standards so that they don't harm us or, or threaten our autonomy. And uh, after developing the emotional intelligence, uh, my research focused on developing a moral reasoning system that uh, balances between several moral goals. So it's uh, autonomy, not acting against the will of people, uh, beneficence, making people better, non-maleficence, not harming people, and justice, which is mostly about uh, treating people equally. Um, and uh, because this uh, autonomy was, uh, was an interesting and important uh, aspect of this uh, ethical model, um, we made a distinction between positive and uh, negative autonomy. So negative autonomy is more about the right to be left alone. So it's more about privacy and mental integrity and physical integrity. And positive autonomy is more about uh, being able to make 
well informed, well reflected de the decision. So it's about adequate information, cognitive functioning, and reflection. And uh, with this model, um, uh, an, uh, an artificial intelligence, you could say, was was able to simulate uh, decisions. Uh, for instance, on a sort of outreach or uh, judicial coercion. So one example was uh, somebody who said, uh, "If I uh, he was an alcoholic, and he said, if I start drinking again, I want to be put in a, in an institution to uh, force me to stop drinking. And then uh, when he, uh, when he uh, started drinking, he was put into an institution and he started a law case against this judicial coercion. But then uh, the judge said, no, in this case, uh, it was your own decision to be uh, uh, taken into an institution. And um, um, yeah, judicial decisions in, in, uh, like this uh, could be simulated with this uh, model of autonomy. And uh, then we also found out that, we, that this um, uh, ethical decision-making model should be connected to the emotional intelligence. Because otherwise, uh, the distinction in the in the trolley dilemma and the footbridge dilemma could, uh, couldn't be made. Uh, I gave an interview to Vice Motherboard once about cars that, that might uh, start to, uh, to to make ethical decisions. If you have self-driving cars, and for instance, they need to uh, make a decision between hitting a tree or uh, and and killing the driver probably, or uh, hitting a bunch of school children, then uh, you know it's uh, uh, an interesting dilemma because who would who would want to buy a car that, that could uh, make a decision to kill them. Um, uh, but uh, there, there's a difference between the trolley and the footbridge dilemma. And the trolley dilemma is uh, you're standing uh, at, a, at a lever and a trolley is going to hit one person. Uh, no, the, the trolley is going to hit five people. But you can s uh, switch the lever and then it will co kill only one instead of five. And then if you ask people, would you do this? Then uh, over 80% of the people usually say, yeah, I would switch the lever because then uh, uh, there's only one person killed instead of five, so I saved four people. But if you have the same dilemma, uh, but with a small change, uh, so that you're standing on a footbridge and there's a, a big guy standing in front of you and you see the, the train is going to run over five people, uh, and you can save them by pushing the big guy in front of the train so the train will stop and uh, only the big guy will be dead and not the five people. Then more than 80% of people say they wouldn't push the big guy in front of the train. So uh, um, for the rational uh, ethical decision making model, this is actually uh, the, exactly the same dilemma. Uh, to be able to make the, 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 the ethical decision making human like, it would uh, have to be connected to the to the emotion model uh, because um, it has to do with uh, um, um, uh, with proximity and with the, the the effect this has on your emotions. If you push a big guy uh, that's actually in front of uh, in front of you, uh, if you have to push him, then then it's of course uh, uh, it has a, a much larger effect in on your emotions than if you're standing away. Uh, and only switch a lever and the person that you're basically killing is, is f much farther away from you and uh, actually this emotional processing is also interesting to think of uh, when when military uh, when the military is, carry is is killing people with drones that are uh, from a far distance because that also has to do with emotional processing and then you could argue it's much easier to kill to kill people that way so um, I think every artificial intelligence should have uh, a form of ethics at some point. Uh, this is, uh, could be seen as a form of safety. Uh, if you have uh, a machine that, uh, that, that uh, uh, what do you say, that cuts your, cuts your grass uh, in your garden, that it's, uh, you know, there's always some safety to make sure that uh, that it will stop. Uh, for instance, if uh, if uh, somebody's uh, hand uh, gets close to it, and the same way you could argue you need to have uh, um, AI safety so that it doesn't make decisions that go uh, against uh, people. Um, and it's, yeah, I like the, the the term friendly AI to make sure that uh, AI will act friendly against us. Um, to be able to control these, these uh, ethical standards, I think every uh, AI should be open source. 
Um, also because otherwise the programmers of this AI have a lot of power over us if we cannot control how they program this artificial intelligence when this artificial intelligence is making decisions about us. And also because uh, I think good ideas are made to be copied. Um, if uh, somebody has a good idea and programs it and if everybody can use this idea, this will increase innovation a lot. So it will, it will help innovation. And then if you're asking how can we decide about these ethical rules together and make sure not only the programmers do it. Uh, I like uh, e-democracy. Um, next to the, to the Pirate Party, I'm also uh, uh, active uh, at uh, the Citizens Foundation, which is a foundation that, uh, that does projects with e-democracy. Um, I got in touch with them because we uh, uh, started uh, a project um, in 2014. It was the, the, the STEM van Amsterdam, the voice of Amsterdam. So everybody who's living in Amsterdam can go to this platform, uh, the STEM van, and then of Amsterdam West or Amsterdam East or well, uh, any city area. And if they have a good ID, they can put it on the platform. Uh, they can uh, give arguments for and against the ID, they can vote it up or down. And if, it, if the ID gets enough votes, then the politicians will, uh, will uh, uh, well, discuss this ID and usually they, they will also execute the ID. So it's a, a nice way to get the best IDs uh, bottom up from society into politics. And I also like that you vote on IDs, not on parties or persons. Uh, I think uh, people will make uh, much better and more, well, yeah, you could say rational choices if, if they vote on IDs and not vote on uh, a face. And you're not dependent on, on the power of a person, but you, you because you, you basically decentralize the decision-making process. Um, yeah, this is about the Citizen Foundation. They have projects uh, all around the world, basically. Um, and this I already explained. Uh, this is uh, how it used to look like before. So you can put an ID there. Uh, the arguments for and against, that's, that's maybe important to, uh, to take notice of, are in a different column. And this prevents uh, people from, you know, getting into arguments uh, uh, about, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and fighting each other in an argument. Uh, this makes sure that, that every argument should be about the ID itself and not about each other's arguments. And this, this also uh, prevents, uh, yeah, uh, uh, like uh, bad, bad discussions uh, that, that uh, um, yeah, so th it makes sure that, that, uh, that, that, that the debate is all always uh, positive and constructive and uh, nobody really ever has to be banned from a pet platform because uh, a lot of people think uh, there could be misuse, uh, but uh, actually uh, it turns out that people, uh, because of this design, uh, almost always stay uh, productive and constructive. Uh, you can, of course, uh, not, not everybody wants to uh, be so active and always be involved in every discussion. So there can be uh, also forms of representation in an e-democracy in which you, uh, you, you decide for yourself whether you want to be represented uh, for certain topics or, uh, or always, uh, but you can also always take back your vote. So if you, you can say, oh, my neighbor uh, uh, is an education, so I want him to make uh, a decision about education for me. And then if he makes a decision that you don't like, you take back your vote. And you can also say, oh, I, I don't really care. I don't, uh, I, I, but I trust this guy and this guy will make all the decisions for me. Uh, and then you, you don't need to be involved, but you have always the right uh, to take back your vote and start making decisions for yourself. And I think this also uh, makes a representation much more personal and it's a way to also bring trust back in politics. And with this way, we can use the internet not to repress people, but to be connected. And uh, because we are all connected, we are actually bigger than the biggest tech company or the, the biggest government. And this way we can, we can well, basically uh, give power back to the people. Um, one and one very interesting question that I still uh, also find find hard to answer myself is whether they, there could be a good symbiosis between uh, artificial intelligence and e-democracy, because there are definitely a lot of benefits. Um, 
So for instance, uh, hinting people on topics that they that, that they will probably like or um, or, or try to make uh, decisions that are good for everyone. Uh, have, have an artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, make make intelligent suggestions based on what uh, what the people say. But then again, you have all, all these problems with uh, who is going to control this artificial intelligence, and if it goes wrong, then it's then it will have uh, a huge effect. So this is this is something uh, I think is interesting to debate. So yeah, I'm getting to the end. I put some links on the, on the presentation. I also put the presentation online, so you can uh, you can uh, find these links if you want to learn more. Uh, I have some privacy tips in here. Uh, I think you probably know most of them, but uh, it's basically use alternatives to big tech, um, and enc use encrypted uh, messaging services and email. Um, uh, take notice that everything you put online will probably be online forever. Uh, pay cash as much as possible. Uh, make sure that you know that smart actually means vulnerable surveillance device. And there are some good uh, plugins uh, that you can use um, to make sure you aren't tracked or to um, uh, um, automatically click on the background on a lot of things so that uh, the, the algorithms get uh, uh, garbage information and they cannot uh, this way get get disturbed this this is I think this is an interesting approach it can be sometimes more effective uh, there's a book machine medical ethics uh, which was also about uh, the, the research into ethics uh, for uh, technology uh, and it uh, contains a lot of interesting chapters also from other people uh, you can buy it, but maybe you can also just find it online for free. And I have no idea how that happens. So thanks. Um, yeah, I've, al I've also been, been introduced as uh, being active for the Pirate Party. And it's true, actually, I'm, I'm the lead candidate now for the coming elections. So you can definitely vote for me. But to, to make sure that you can vote for me everywhere and, and the rest of the party, of course, everywhere in the, in the country, we need uh, signatures. And people actually need to go to uh, the municipality building, uh, ma make a signature on a form uh, under the eyes of uh, of uh, uh, someone working at the municipality, a civil servant, and then the, you get a stamp, and then we need to get back the form. So especially in times of Corona, this is uh, a quite an effort we need to make. So uh, if uh, if you want to help us with this or you, you want to send it to your friends and family uh, to make a signature that we get on the voting ballot everywhere around the country, then uh, of course your help is very much appreciated. So thanks all for your attention and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, questions and debate about this. So thank you Matthijs also for the Sentite for Politieke Partijen. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, um, I propose we now uh, take a few minutes uh, uh, for people to ask questions to you and for you answering them. And after that, we uh, uh, we have um, a break and then we continue in two different uh, uh, variants, two different groups, as the students know. So, we would like to ask a question and you can either do that by uh, raising your virtual hand. Maybe, Matthijs, it's better that you uh, stop sharing your... Uh, yeah. Uh, your slides then we can see more people in the screen um, but you can also type your question in the uh, uh, chat So there is a question from Martin in the chat. It was uh, already 10 minutes ago. Uh, what about human dignity? Would it be legally allowed to instruct a car or robot to actively kill someone to save others? Yeah, so uh, uh, this, uh, this is, I think, uh, very interesting. I think, um, well, it, it probably should be because uh, you, can, you can save lives by doing it, but still, um, there, there needs to be, uh, yeah, a, a judicial framework to to, to make sure uh, that this this can happen, and also, uh, actually, to 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 uh, uh, make it an imperative. 
and uh, also I think now it's it's one of the one of the things that's uh, well there's a, a lot of things stopping uh, self-driving cars because it's also just uh, a technical quite difficult in uh, in uh, busy areas but also the, the the question who is responsible if a, if a self-driving car hits what hits someone and um, that, that's also one of the things uh, still stopping it Yunus uh, asks, was there any role of AI in the Toeslagen affaire? So the child uh, benefit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were also struggling yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, I was, I was definitely struggling <laughs> with it, yeah. Uh, well, the, the child so, so people that are not Dutch, yeah, there, there was an, uh, 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 a serious problem in the last 10 years uh, with uh, some benefits, some subsidy that was uh, handed out by the Dutch government. So what they did is that they had some uh, ways to find possible fraud and uh, they overgeneralized uh, to a large extent uh, uh, the, the groups that were committing fraud and uh, for those people there was no uh, uh, that it was almost impossible to prove that they were not committing fraud and now the the uh, actual our government will uh, maybe step aside this friday because of this child yeah. allowances kinder toeslag yeah child yeah child child allowance or child care allowance i think actually yeah child care allowance that's yeah. i think yeah. correct okay um, so was there any uh, AI involved? Um, well, actually, I think this is this is still being found out, as far as I know. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, parents are trying to get information about uh, why was I being targeted and why was I being accused. Uh, also, because there there there's there it seems like there there was a, a racial bias in it, um, and I think it's it's still. Uh, very hard to get any good information about this from the government, but they they are now, uh, well, they, they are admitting that that uh, a lot of mistakes were made, of course, and so. But uh, uh, I hope this this will be co become uh, more clear, and maybe maybe someone else uh, knows more about this. But as far as I know, uh, it's it's still unclear whether whether AI had a role. But uh, uh, therefore, I also I, in my presentation I used uh, Siri and uh, VGS because this is uh, this is really about uh, connecting data and using algorithms to accuse people. And and in in those cases, I'm completely sure this because this this is actually the point of the of the law. So there's another question in the chat. It's a long question, so uh, maybe you can read it yourself. Um, yeah. I'm getting some compliments, so so well. Thanks for the compliments. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to remind the slide that compared drug use Hi, and I think from different uh, groups of people with the inmates ratios for drug use for the same groups, which is a very interesting example of how biased exploration will lead to biased results. Yeah, that that was the point of the slide, indeed. Wouldn't this be the case when having targeted surveillance instead of uniform surveillance? Uh, well, that, that's a that's a very good question. Yeah, if you have targeted surveillance, then there should still be um, a lot of uh, uh, checks on um, indeed how how you how you target certain people. So um, th th there should be also a, a possibility for debate in society on how you target people. Um, so. Uh, the, the, sometimes uh, secret, secret services uh, they, they need some kind of secrecy but sometimes it should be completely secret and also uh, also with the, the uh, surveillance of the of the regular police it, it shouldn't be completely secret uh, what they use to target people uh, and there should be some 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 debate about uh, what is used and what isn't being used uh, and a lot of times this is uh, this is used as an excuse uh, as authorities like we need to operate in secret because otherwise criminals will be able to you know to to prevent uh, being being surveyed uh, but they often uh, uh, go too far with this you know they have a point to a certain extent but still we should have a debate about uh, what can what can we use to target people 
um, uh, definitely how much surveillance is there because also they, they wouldn't uh, say for instance uh, how many people they were tapping with well well that is something uh, we should know I think now uh, finally we, we we do know but uh, yeah we, we should have a societal debate about uh, what do we want to target on what don't want the what do we not want to target on and there should be uh, at least uh, independent independent uh, audit committees that uh, that audits uh, every algorithm. So the in in many cases I would want to have full uh, full transparency for algorithms. And if it's if it's if it's really not possible uh, because uh, um, it would uh, benefit uh, crime too much, then uh, there should be an independent audit committee to make sure that we are not uh, stigmatizing uh, certain groups. Um, then are now quite some questions. Yeah. So Yunus, Yunus, as as a, as a question about Siri. Yeah. Um, is it true that the researchers have kept some of the patterns that they have found for future research? Uh, I would assume so. Why? Um. Well, yeah. Maybe. Maybe because uh, uh, also uh, a little bit of cynicism uh, uh, after uh, uh, previous uh, uh, previous cases uh, in the government. Also, the, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, about how secret services work. Then uh, what I uh, heard from people that were in uh, Commissie Stiekem that that can check what uh, uh, how the secret services are operating. Uh, they said a few interesting things. Uh, one of the things was uh, not so many people are actually in the Commissie Stiekem are actually reading uh, what the secret services are doing because they are cannot uh, talk about it. So uh, they, they cannot use it politically. So they don't really uh, use their uh, uh, use their uh, power to, to actually check on the secret services. Uh, but also that uh, they just do whatever they can. Uh, but uh, the only uh, benefit we have from uh, all the all the all the regulations on what they can and what they cannot do is that if they do something illegal, it cannot be used in law cases. But uh, probably they will still do it. So there was just an uh, I think it was a court decision in uh, uh, the uh, uh, the U.S. that a company that was collecting data. Uh, based on uh, without uh, consent had to remove all the data but also had to remove all the algorithms that were based on that data so that's i think a nice example of how also uh, uh, courts and regulation bodies start to see that it is not only the problem that you do bad things with data but it also has consequences so hopefully that will uh, uh, we will see that more yeah yeah i definitely hope so and also it's um uh, I think there should be a lot of uh, transparency so that you can actually uh, check as, as much as possible whether data was really thrown away and there wasn't some secret backup and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I see a number of questions. So maybe you should try to be a bit yeah. quick because we can also not continue for half yeah, an hour. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Ninka asks uh, the next question. How would you find uh, how would you find out the actual drug use among ethnicities in contrast to who is out in prison for it. Can an algorithm this info instead of the prison rates, or is this untrustworthy? Well, I think for the for the example I used, they just asked people about their drug use. Um, so uh, that is that is uh, self-reported data, and the, the the data of people in prison is of course uh, uh, that that that's of course public info. Um, so then I'm not sure about the question actually. I think it was just a question about the procedure. How is the ah, data okay, collected? Okay. Yeah. So then I, so then the I hope that to, uh, I answered this question. Otherwise, uh, please uh, ask for more clarification. Yeah. Um, then Ima, Ima wants to know whether open source uh, would that not be a uh, bummer for the innovation? Yeah, How I don't does think your party react to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, I can also uh, just personally react to it because, uh, for instance, this uh, Citizens Foundation, for which I'm uh, well also uh, a volunteer, but uh, but they uh, they also make money, uh, and you, um, you uh, at least to pay the people that that are doing the work. Um, and uh, you're you're creating value in society. You already have a benefit by being the first uh, to have some uh, innovative technology. But also, um, also with with open source uh, software, still uh, you know it needs to be kept up to date. Uh, so th there's just uh, uh, SLAs with uh, with uh, companies that are using the software or governments that are using the software. Uh, so it's basically a contract to keep maintaining the software. So th th you can still uh, uh, make uh, make money in open source. And th yeah, it's it's just in general that uh, if everybody can innovate, but people are still working, um, uh, people are not reinventing the wheel. So they're doing more useful work, and they're still getting paid for the work that they do. Okay, then we have th three more questions, and then we uh, uh, we s we stop this session and uh, have a brief break. Um, there is one from. Uh, Amrish, and there are two people with a raised hand, Joshua and Bilterman. Yeah, Amrish uh, thinks uh, we should give up some privacy in order to stay safe and to make sure people abide the laws that we have. Um, but what is my opinion about the point of diminishing returns related to privacy versus security? At what point should we really realize when we traded too much privacy for comfort and security? Well, um, I think uh, I think I, I pretty much explained it already, my, my view on this. I think we should only, um, uh, uh, only when there's a, a clear suspicion, I think, or, or at least a relation to a suspicion or a, a, a good motivation while people uh, could be a suspect, then I think you should, uh, uh, um, uh, then, then I think privacy should become less because then there's there's a motivated reason for it. But in other cases, I think uh, there's more danger in governing of privacy uh, than than uh, benefits in terms of safety, because uh, then you're only surveying innocent people and uh, it's not effective. Um, uh, you need to have a lot a lot more um, uh, people uh, doing the surveillance to to do surveillance on all these people that uh, that are innocent. Um, okay, then some, these are more remarks, then. Yeah, uh, so there is now a question from Joshua. He raised his hand already for some time. Oh, yeah, so Joshua, Joshua. Can, you, can you make your question? Yeah. Um, you talk quite abstractly about the trolley problem being like a legislative issue or a ethical issue, but it seems to me that it's more of a commercial issue because you're not, you're not saying I'm going to pay for a car which is going to choose to kill me. You're saying I'm paying for a car, which is actually much more likely to be safe. You know, there's a hundred times less likely I die in a self-driven car than if I'm doing it myself. So to that extent, is it not the, 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 the choice of the consumer to make these decisions rather than like an ethical or legislative issue? Um, well, I, I agree to your point that, that uh, in the future, uh, self-driving cars will, will be a lot safer anyway in general. But still, if there would, if the, the 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 market would be free, companies would be free to make cars that either uh, uh, save you and and not kill others. But there's also other competitors in the market, and uh, they they are building cars that will always uh, save the driver. And uh, also, if it's uh, if it means uh, uh, killing uh, other people, then then I think uh, you you shouldn't have uh, competition on on. On, on these ethics, I think uh, uh, the, the the same the same ethical rules should should go for everyone. Does that answer your just uh, does that answer your question? Uh, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then um, Bultemann has a question. Sorry, I don't see your first name. Yeah, I, I tried to change it, but I couldn't while on the call. So sorry about that. Uh, my name is Franz. Uh, I have a question on uh, the e-democracy. Um, you say you want to have it through like a, a web platform where people can uh, cast their vote, um, especially if you're looking at what is happening right now where people are being, and you also mentioned this in uh, your lecture, where people are being influenced uh, by either fake media or uh, other uh, forms. 
Um, and also, if you look at a lot of polls online that are being taken over by trolls or, or other kind of uh, people, um, yeah, wouldn't you say that this poses a very big risk uh, to the democracy itself? Where, um, yeah. Uh, for the first thing, uh, that uh, people are, are being influenced. Uh, people are also being influenced when they vote for parties or persons. Uh, I think actually uh, it's harder to... Um, to influence people if, if you're influencing them about an ID than if you're uh, influencing them about voting on a person. Uh, it's, it's much harder to, to, make, uh, yeah, to make an ID unattractive and then for instance to, uh, to uh, it's easier to talk shit about a person than, than to talk shit about an ID, I think. Um, and um, well, then uh, there, there's uh, polls being, being, being trolled. That was the second thing, I think. Um, a lot of people are afraid for this. If you see at how these platforms are being used, then uh, so far it doesn't happen. It has to do a lot with, uh, with the, the, the design of the platform. But still, uh, I also, uh, I'm, I'm also from the school of, uh, you know, Rob Gongrijp with uh, We Don't Trust Voting Computers. And uh, I don't trust voting computers. I think, uh, the, for instance, the, 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 the below should also always be on paper or there should at least be a paper trail. Uh, so therefore, I would also say that uh, these, these platforms, they, they should formally uh, still be an advice. And then I think it's good how Amsterdam implemented it now, uh, that uh, still uh, politicians decide about uh, uh, what to do with the input on the platform. Um, generally, uh, if there's a lot of support for an ID, then then they will they will perform it. But still, uh, if uh, you know something would uh, end up at some uh, some uh, HN or something, and uh, people would massively vote for uh, for a stupid ID, then uh, then they could they, then they can still stop the ID. Uh, and an important thing is, of course, to uh, to make uh, to give. A, a clear window about what what can the IDs be about and what can't they be about, you know. So, the, so uh, uh, an, an ID couldn't cost an, an endless amount of money, and it also it should stick to all the other important aspects of democracy. And a democracy is more about voting. Uh, it's it's also uh, you know human rights, civil rights. Uh, so a lot of IDs uh, uh, should be impossible because they 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 break our basic civil rights or they are against the. Uh, the, the constitution. That's that's by the way another thing that uh, I think we should uh, we should uh, 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 allow laws to to be uh, checked against the constitution because it would uh, prevent uh, a lot of uh, a lot of bad laws. Uh, actually, I think a lot of laws we have in the Netherlands now are against the constitution. But uh, uh, well, anyway, I'm I'm drifting away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Matthijs, I really would like to thank you very much for your uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, there were a uh, lot of questions uh, and there are still questions popping up. Uh, so maybe you have, um, uh, you can share your email address uh, to, uh, uh, to people uh, so that they can ask you questions yeah, in definitely. person or you find another way to answer them. I think we should now stop this plenary session and uh, have a brief break and then at five at uh, 325 uh, we start again in the two dif different groups so that's for the students mm -hmm. we now have 10 minutes break and then in the two different groups we start again at uh, 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 325 Matthijs thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you very much very interesting Oh, and one practical issue, Matthijs, uh, can you send the slides that you uh, uh, presented so that I can put them on the Canva site? Yeah. And also the other arrangements that we made, I expect your email. Yeah, okay. Okay, very good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.